want to take you down on the ground for a moment and give you the scientific story behind the planetary boundaries. The three pieces of extraordinary advancements in Earth system science that took us to the point where we, per necessity, needed to define a safe operating space for humanity's future on Earth. And the first piece of the science is undoubtedly what I would argue being the most important message from science to humanity over the past 30 years. We've entered a whole new geological epoch. We're now the dominating force of change on planet Earth. My fellow scientist, Will Steffen, leading Earth system scientist that we unfortunately lost two months ago, he expressed it in the following way. We're now starting to hit the ceiling of hardwired processes that regulates the state and functioning of the entire Earth system. We're working right now in my institute by showing the evidence that we're no longer in the Anthropocene, we're deep into the Anthropocene. We're starting to see the loss of the resilience, which actually put into question Vice President Al Gore's final statement here of this optimistic assumption that the IPCC correctly does, that if we stop emitting greenhouse gases, the Earth system will be so powerful in its natural processes that it will simply suck up the carbon and get the temperatures down. This is the challenge. It's coming back into the planetary boundaries that gives us any chance of that to be true. Now, the Anthropocene is the scale and the pace and connectivity in a globalized world. It translates to something which I would call the current turbulence in the world. We have a geopolitical crisis, we have a climate crisis, but we also have an ecological crisis. 70% of the populations of vertebrates have been lost over the past 70 years. One million of eight million known species are extinct, are risk at extinction in just the next decades. But this is not the fundamental challenge with the ecological crisis, is that we're losing the ability for moisture recycling, for carbon sequestration, for food production. It's fundamentally also linked to the fourth crisis, the zoonotic disease outbreaks of pandemics. We've talked about that today. That hockey stick you saw earlier this morning of the pandemics across the world, well, they're all zoonosis. They're all viral spillovers from wildlife via domestic animals to humans, very likely. And this is in itself indicatively caused by unsustainable overexploitation of natural habitats. So not only do we have simultaneous global crisis, we are moving towards what potentially is a polycrisis, when crisis interacts and reinforce each other. That's where we're in. We're in this turbulent phase of transition. Now, so far on climate, we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming. It's sourced from six different empirical observation stations across the world. I've just pointed out the two extreme points here, which is the 1998 and the 2016 El Nino events. You remember them, perhaps. I was myself in Kenya during the terrible flooding of 1998, just extraordinary extreme peaks. Well, we've had three years of La Nina. Three years of La Nina, which normally should mean a cooler temperature, but despite that, 2022 is the fifth warmest year on record, and it's the most expensive year in terms of loss and damage. 313 US dollars in payment check from the climate impacts estimated last year across the entire world. Just the Pakistan floods is very likely a 20 billion US dollar price tag. As you've seen, NOAA projects that we're going into an, 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 an Nino phase probably later this year, but very likely next year. We're actually likely to bump into 1.5 already by 2024. This will, apart from the extreme events it will cause, it will also certainly surface this questioning of whether 1.5 degrees Celsius can be held as the target that we've all agreed upon. I will be giving you the science why we need to hold on to 1.5 as a physical limit. We cannot abandon 1.5. But this is where we are in a jumpy situation. And just like Al Gore pointed out, IPCC, the common denominator, the consensus across the entire climate science community, is now very clear in its language. This is the high-level summaries from the summary report that came out of the AR6 just a few weeks back. I'm highlighting three, in my mind, key insights. Number one, we're in the midst of the crisis. It's hitting human well-being across the world today. But secondly, for the first time, the IPCC makes clear we're threatening the stability of the planet. This is what the planetary boundary science has been saying since 2009. It also says, if you look at the lower sentence here on the slide, <clears throat> for the first time, that there is no safe landing for humanity on 1.5 only by phasing out fossil fuels. We need to keep the natural processes intact. Actually, the IPCC even gives a number here. Up to 50% of intact nature on land needs to be kept intact for carbon sinks 
and uh, carbon sequestration capacity. This is actually exactly the planetary boundary on land. So it just shows us that the movement of direction is towards interdisciplinary global sustainability science also to deal with the climate crisis. Now the science and support of what is at stake is rising by every paper that is coming out. And here I'm showing what I find to be personally perhaps one of the most impactful graphs I've seen over the past two years. I should be clear here though, this is the Potsdam Institute's Climber 2 EMIC climate model led by Andrei Ganopolsky and Matteo Willett. But it's the first time we're able with just physics and mathematics to reproduce the journey of our home, planet Earth, over the past three million years. That's the x-axis, the entire quaternary, the Pleistocene plus the Holocene. The y-axis, global mean surface temperature, zero is the pre-industrial 14 degrees Celsius point. The black line is validation data. You recognize the last million years, ice core data, the Milankovic cycling between 100,000 years of ice ages, short 15 to 30,000 years of interglacials. We've had six to eight of those. But look at the green line, how the planet is dancing. Oh yes, a lot of natural variability, solar forcing, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, in and out of cold ice ages and warm interglacials, but not at one time, as far as we understand today, did we reach two degrees. The warmest point on Earth is below two. The coldest point is roughly minus five deep ice age. I call this today the corridor of life. Why? Well, it's because we have all evidence that the Earth prior to the quaternary is not an Earth that we recognize as an Earth that we know it. It has a different configuration of the continents. It has different chemistry, biology, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, water cycle. It's another type of planet. It's only in the quaternary that we have a reference point for a planet that is at any assemblance of the living planet that we depend on for our future. So this graph in itself, I would argue, is enough for climate action because we're following a pathway that takes us to 2.7 degrees Celsius in only seven years, 70 years. I mean, that is undoubtedly, without any hesitation in science, a catastrophe. This graph is enough to show we want to stay away well below two. We are today at 1.2, the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age. And we have that data as well. It's incredible to see the Osmar et al. synthesis that came out in 21, you know, 2021. Actually, throughout the whole planetary boundary science, I have always said that the Holocene is a reference point for desired planet that we depend on for human development. That, I would argue, is scientifically quite well established today. We've been on planet Earth for 200,000 years as modern humans. We've lived through two ice ages and two interglacials. But it's only when we leave the last ice age, some 16,000 years ago, that we shift over from hunters and gatherers, a few million people, to basically just 2,000 years into the Holocene, and we do the most important invention of all of our civilizational history on Earth, the Neolithic Revolution. We become sedentary farmers, we domesticate animals and plants, and off we go into the civilizational journey that takes us to the point when we can meet today and talk about artificial intelligence and massive innovations in science for humanity's future. Now, I've been saying throughout this journey that the Holocene is a 14 degrees Celsius planet plus minus one degree. I was wrong. The Osmar et al. paper shows that it was even more narrow. It's a 14 degrees Celsius plus minus 0 0.5. All the variability that climate denialists love to pick forward, the medieval warm period where Vikings supposedly were picking grape on the southern points of Greenland, where Carl X Gustav, the Swedish king, invaded Denmark in the late 17th century, walking over the ice between Sweden and Denmark because of the Little Ice Age. All of this, sure, it happened. It was natural variability within 0.5. This is a very deep insight. We use this in the planetary boundary science as a reference point for the desired state of the planet. We know the Holocene, we measure against it. The drama is that we also know increasingly why the planet stayed in this extraordinarily stable state. It's not that the sun was so gentle to us. It's not that volcanic eruptions were so um, non-abundant. It is because of a healthy biosphere. You've always seen, I'm sure, the global carbon projects, uh, global carbon cycle updates each year. 
You see the graph here to the left from 1850 until today. It's our journey of fossil fuel burning. You see the hockey stick in gray of fossil fuel. Hockey stick in orange, deforestation. Is it all of this that has caused, accumulated in the atmosphere to cause 1.2 degrees Celsius so far? The answer is no. We all know this. We know that the dark blue part here is the ocean uptake. The green part is the intact nature uptake. And the more we stress the system with energy imbalance, the more nature, the more Earth has been helping us, applying its biogeophysical systems to dampen and reduce warming. This is a healthy planet responding to stress because the Holocene is an attractor with feedbacks that keeps the system in an equilibrium. The numbers are quite clear. We've had the privilege of a 50% uptake of a healthy planet over this entire period. This is the largest subsidy to the world economy, completely hidden. And here comes the key point in reference back to uh, Vice President Al Gore. The IPCC models, even in the AR6, assumes that this will continue. Assumes that we can count on the ocean. We can count on intact nature. The problem is we're seeing more and more scientific papers showing cracks in this system. We have the latest synthesis in the Brazilian part of the Amazon rainforest showing that over the past 10 years, the richest terrestrial ecosystem on planet Earth, the Amazon rainforest, has shifted over from sink to source. Can you imagine? She's not helping us anymore in the tropical rainforest system. We're seeing signs from Finland, the per capita richest temperate forest country in the world, that has so far already, in 2022, shifted over from sink to source in the temperate forest systems. We're seeing signs of similar developments in Germany, in Sweden, in Russia, in Canada. This is worrying. It's, it's warning signals of losing resilience in the Earth system. We also have the ocean playing exactly the same role for us. 95% of the heat caused by our fossil fuel burning is taken up in the ocean, hiding out the heat. The planet is a thermostat. Now the El Nino dynamics is showing how this is potentially hitting back at us at a higher frequency with more severe magnitude. So we have to be very careful when we uh, just easily consider the pathway to the future is only to decarbonize the energy system. It's actually to come back within planetary boundaries to keep the resilience intact. But I want to come back to the climate boundary and just make the scientific point that 1.5 is really a physical limit. We mapped the tipping elements of the climate system published in Science a year back. 16 climate tipping element systems has now, over 15 years of scientific advancement, been, you know, criteria very, very robustly selected they must fulfill two key criteria. One is that they scientifically contribute, I mean, they have evidence of contributing to the state of the climate system. And secondly, that they have multiple stable states. Push them too far and they cross the tipping point. Here you have the map of the 16. I just show it to make the point that they are distributed across the entire planet. We all depend on them. I personally, that's not published anywhere, but I personally consider these to be the global commons, the new global commons in the Anthropocene. Because we all, independent of where we live, depend on the stability of these systems because they help us. They have negative feedbacks dominating their equilibrium state and they thereby cool and dampen pressures from climate change. Here you have the more scientific assessment of these 16. On the x-axis you have the tipping element systems and you have uh, IPCC red embers assessment of confidence on um, temperature assessments, so the y-axis is at what temperature are they at risk of crossing their tipping points. The black dotted lines is the median level, so that's the likely point of crossing a tipping point. And now I'll put on the 1.5 line. And what you see is that four of these systems, the ones furthest to the left, are likely to cross their tipping points already at 1.5. And these are the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, all tropical coral reef systems, livelihoods for over 150 million people in coastal areas in the equatorial belt on planet Earth, and abrupt thawing of permafrost in the boreal zone up in the Arctic. Just the two ice sheets hold 10 meter sea level rise. It wouldn't crash overnight, of course. It would take perhaps 1,000 years, but it would be unstoppable. It would be a feedback shift and a transition towards a new equilibrium state. I would argue that this provides tremendous scientific support for holding on to 1.5. Is this one science group saying this, or is it something that we're increasingly seeing mainstreamed in a consensus in science? I would argue yes, because here is the trajectory between the AR5 and the AR6 in terms of risk assessment. So here is the IPCC's uh, red ember diagrams 
on risks for ecosystems, but I'll just put on all of these red embers. You've probably seen them. Focus on the furthest to the right, the one right here, which is the IPCC assessment of large-scale singular events, which is basically nonlinear dynamics and irreversible changes in large tipping element systems. The AR5 estimates the risks at roughly 3 degrees Celsius, but look at the more the science advances, the more we learn that Earth is more sensitive to pressures of climate forcing, and that the risk level, even in the IPCC assessment, is now down to between 1.5 and 2. And the IPCC AR6 has a list of 16 tipping element systems without temperature levels, but they have a qualitative assessment. So there we are, and we really need to understand that the planetary boundaries is about avoiding crossing these thresholds to keep the systems at a state that still supports us. I just want to show one slide, though, what the implications can be if we do not turn around very quickly in terms of impacts on security. This is work from Xu et al. and colleagues at Exeter University. I think this is one of the graphs that should be in every foreign policy ministry in the world today. On color, you have the traditional fragility maps of economies, so darker the red, the more fragile the nations, but it's a health layer combined with climate impact assessments. So what you see here in the black spots are the regions that have an average temperature exceeding 29 degrees Celsius on an annual basis. This is a health threshold. Go above this and you have health threats to us humans. That's why, not surprisingly, it's only in the Sahara Desert you see this extreme heat. The dashed lines is the assessment, if we continue burning fossil fuels as today, the regions that will have this health-threatening temperature in only 50 years' time. This is a 2070 assessment. Just look at the map. Just look at the map. Brazil, West Africa, Horn of Africa, Middle East. Look at India, soon world's most populated nations. 3.5 billion people living in regions where the vulnerable, who cannot afford hiding behind air-conditioned housing, will have the risk of social instability, potential collapse, migration, and we see increasingly related risks related also to conflict. This is, of course, something we have to avoid. It's a recipe for instability of the world economy. The frontier in science, though, is, is amongst others, this. We're seeing more and more evidence that these tipping element systems are connected through cascades, even. So we have 16, 16 systems, but we have several scientific papers out now showing that when the green ice sheet melts so fast, warming three times faster than the average of planet Earth, releasing cold, fresh water, it slows down the thermodynamic engine of overturning of heat in the North Atlantic. This is well established, 15% slowdown over the past 30 years. This pushes the monsoon further south, which can explain the rapid dieback and forest fires and reduced rainfall over another tipping element, namely the Amazon rainforest. But of course, slowing down the overturning of heat also means that more saline surface water, warm surface water, is stuck in the Southern Ocean, which can explain why the West Antarctic ice sheet is warming faster, melting faster than we had expected. And interconnectivity between the Arctic and Antarctica through the tipping elements. This is the scientific frontier. So the evidence is, one, Anthropocene, two, the Holocene is our reference, and three is tipping points. And this gives us this heuristic equation that took us to the planetary boundaries. So I just want to share this with you, because we're fellow scientists, that the planetary boundaries was just one little incremental step I would even argue the unavoidable incremental step based on all the evidence we are sitting on. It was kind of an obvious that if we are putting all this pressure on the planet, if we're risking nonlinear change that cannot be stopped, if we have a reference point of a desired planet, two questions arise. Question number one is, what are the processes, the biophysical processes that regulate the state of the planet? And question number two, can we, with the Holocene as a reference point, quantify scientifically boundaries within which we have a high chance of staying within a Holocene-like interglacial state that can support humanity, but go beyond it, and we risk drifting off away from the state that supports humanity. And ta-ta, you have the planetary boundary framework. It was published the first time in 2009. What you see here is the 2015 update. Here we are, four of the nine boundaries transgressed in our 2015 assessment, climate, biodiversity, land system change and overloading of nitrogen and phosphorus. You see one very important boundary that is inside the safe space here, which is the stratospheric ozone layer. Actually, it was outside, deep in the red in the 1980s, but we actually 
thanks to science, thanks to the fantastic work by Paul Crutzen, Mario Molina, and uh, Sherwood Rowland, who got the Nobel Prize for identifying the depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer, the chemistry behind it, and even showing the pathway to a policy of, of um, uh, forbidding the chlorofluorocarbons that was causing this life-threatening hole in the ozone layer for humanity. The interesting thing with this story is the following. Nobody had seen an ozone hole. Nobody had really experienced the immediate impacts. But the world listened to science. And policy listened to science. And in 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed. And it didn't say an emission pathway. It forbid the gas. It didn't say zero by 2050. It said, from now on, it's finished. And industry was ready to innovate. And that took us to a solution. And since two years, NASA has said, the hole has been closed, we're back into the safe space. And why is this a success story? I always get criticized, say, well, but you know, but the Montreal Protocol, that was an easy one. It was one industry, one set of chemicals, the technologies were there. But I would argue that we've reached a Montreal moment for climate, because the science is settled, just like the Montreal. The policy is settled, just like the Montreal Protocol, because there's nothing less to negotiate with the Paris Agreement. It's all in there. We even have the loss and damage in place, the Article 6, everything is in place. We have all agreed to reach zero by 2050. We have the 1.5 set. The third part has always been missing on climate. We did not have the solutions, but now we have them. We have scalable solutions. So we've reached a Montreal moment on the climate boundary. So the message to you here today is the following. In the midst of the climate crisis, where we're putting so much risk on energy imbalance in the atmosphere, when exactly at that moment you'd like to have a strong, resilient planet, we have, unfortunately, the planet in the weakest point throughout the entire Holocene. That's not a good combination. You don't want to have a weak planet at a point of climate stress. So this is why we need to recognize that the journey we're on is not a journey of decarbonizing the energy system. It's about a global sustainability transition. It's a transformation. And the transformation pathway is increasingly researched. The Earth Commission came out with a paper recently showing that we're really at the edge of the Holocene. That's now a choice point. Will we be able to transform and have a safe landing within safe and just safe operating space? Or will we actually start drifting off unstoppably towards a hothouse Earth state? We know that for the climate boundary, the journey is set. It's actually a pace of 6 to 7% reduction of global emissions per year to half emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. But my message to you is that this is not enough. This is the journey we're on, on climate. Decarbonize the world's energy system in gray, transform the food system from dark brown, the single largest emitter, to become a sink in orange, scaling negative emission technologies in, in real orange, the brown is actually the food system, but then also invest in the resilience on intact nature and land, the green part, which means stop expansion of agriculture in particular to keep intact nature intact, build more regenerative agriculture, and keep the carbon stability in the ocean. We have translated this into the carbon law, which means the pace we need to follow is what I call, inspired by the Moore's law, cutting emissions by half every decade would take us to one of these steps of decarbonizing energy system. This is what we've been discussing here a lot. As Al Gore pointed out, there are really good points of transition. I, I fully agree that we're now turning a corner. This is just a map that I think we've underestimated. 70 countries and regions in the world have a price on carbon. We have 200 countries in the world. And Europe, as has been pointed out several times here, has now adopted not only the ETS2, the Emission Trading Scheme for Agriculture, and transport and construction buildings, but also the CBAM, which is a tax for all imports for those who are trying to export goods to Europe without charging a price on carbon. This, I would argue, may actually create a global price on carbon automatically, bottom up, to level the playing field. Al Gore refer, referred to this, the IPCC positive hockey sticks of exponential rise in, in renewable energy systems. I agree. This is this is really exciting. We did quite recently a back of the envelope showing that the doubling pace over the past 15 years on renewable energy systems is doubling globally every 5.5 years. But it's barely showing on the curve because it's exponential and we start from such a low point. 
But if we continue that pace, just business as usual, we would have 50% of electricity globally from renewable energy by 2030. So it's actually true that we are on these exponentials. It's S curves of change. But unfortunately, we're not yet bending the curve on the fossil fuel generation. But we're seeing a lot of innovation pace. And I would say that one of the most exciting ones, which has been referred to, is the transition in the whole mobility sector. The fact that we are now, for the first time, seeing political leaders saying we have end dates on the combustion engine. That the European Union is setting that date to 2035 just shows that we are on an abrupt change journey. But I want to really end up just with coming back to the biosphere. At COP15 last year, in Montreal, the Kunming Montreal meeting, really established the 1.5 degrees Celsius equivalent on nature, the nature positive agenda, the planetary boundary for nature and nature processes. And that point says we have to stop losing functions in ecosystems from 2020 onwards. This will not be possible because we continue to lose. It means we have to regenerate and invest in nature and have a net positive point by 2030 to uphold that resilience in the Earth system. We are translating this to science-based targets for businesses and cities across the world through the Earth Commission and the Global Commons Alliance. I see a very interesting trajectory there going from carbon to all the other planetary boundaries for businesses and cities. And this is coming out 31st of May in, in also a scientific report that we hope will be useful across communities in the world. And the only kind of final deeper scientific take home I want to just leave with you is that, yes, we are in the Anthropocene. Yes, that is a major, major challenge because we are the dominating geological force of change on planet Earth. But one thing that we at least scientifically can say today is that it is an epoch, but it's a pressure so far. It's not a new state. We still have the window open to keep the planet in a Holocene-like interglacial state. We don't have evidence that we have lost the race, but it is a race because I totally agree with Henry and I agree with Al Gore, who pointed out that it's not a question anymore whether we are at that hump point on the journey towards a, a fossil fuel free world economy. The question is, will we be fast enough? Will we be too late? Will we be able to keep the resilience intact? So that's the journey. And the journey is really about equity, but also innovation and transformation. And of course, science plays a fundamental role here. Thank you very much. I have never heard the case for 1.5 made quite so compellingly as you did then. Would you agree with me? Yeah. We've got a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to take a question from one of our uh, online audience. Um, Arthur, who's the president of the International Environment Forum in Switzerland, what's the planetary boundary for photosynthesis where we've destroyed so much plant life that it can no longer feed all life on the planet? Mm. Well, th thanks for that question. But that's, that's um, really, it's, it's almost as if I had planted that question with him. <laughs> photosynthesis planted. Of course, you, you caught that, didn't you? Um, <laughs> Because in, in the third scientific update, which is in reviewing right now, we are, we are still having a challenge with the biosphere integrity boundary, which has two control variables. One is extinction rates, I mean species, genetic diversity. That's quite easy to measure, and we've had the same boundary definition since 2009, extinction rates per million species per year. But the second one has been much more difficult, which is on functional diversity. We've used mean species abundance, we've used the biosphere integrity index, but this time, we'll be using human appropriation of net primary production. Exactly your suggestion. And uh, we are measuring net primary production through a number of Earth system models and observations and setting the maximum allowed uh, expropriation of net primary production because that is a good indicator both of carbon but also in terms of the health of the entire natural system. It is an aggregate note though because many ecologists will say that it's, uh, it's a bit... Um, clumsy because it doesn't really, it doesn't distinguish between uh, native ecosystems and managed ecosystems, but still we think it can be used at an earth system scale. Now you haven't got population size mm. on those planetary boundaries. Um, why not? And uh, is there a need for a, a separate boundary for population mm. size? Yeah, so that is um, an important question, but it's almost like a, like a whole lecture in itself. 
But, but let, let me put it very simple, and it may surprise you a bit, but um, I, I think you'll, 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 you'll see my point here, that when we um, set out to um, map the planetary boundaries, the question we asked is actually uh, kind of disconnected from us humans. We're just asking the question, what does it take to keep the planet in a Holocene state? biophysically in a Holocene state. And once we've defined that, irrespective of number of humans or human needs or human wants, we can then put humanity back within that safe operating space. And then the planetary boundary framework, therefore, is completely agnostic to whether we are five or 10 billion, or whether we are poor or rich, or whether we are high or low consumer, or whether we have growth or no growth. I believe that was a, a really important choice. The limits to growth, for example, did it differently. They mapped natural resources on Earth as well as you could, 1972, and then compare that with human needs and made assumptions on technology. And they failed because they assessed, a bit like Malthus, underestimated the pace of innovation uh, in terms of resource efficiency. The planetary boundary framework, on the other hand, makes no such assumptions. We don't meddle whatsoever with human needs, wants, innovation. We just say, here's the fence. Play your game inside that fence. Then if you play like Lionel Messi, or as I would have played if I was on a football pitch, that's up to humanity. Thank you. We've got time for a couple of quick questions uh, from inside the audience. Uh, gentleman there. Uh, my name is John Porter, and um, I'm from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and uh, I worked for the IPCC since uh, 1994, I think. I started with them. Again, it's a question about the things that may be included in the planetary boundary. And do you think there should, uh, Johan, do you think there should be a planetary boundary for gross domestic product, for example? I mean, because we are, are we coming, is that something which is pushing us outside the, the levels of safety within the, within the planetary boundaries? Because is that the engine which is actually pushing us outside into the area of... I mean, you can argue it both ways. You can say, you know, GDP generates investment, which you can use for producing uh, non-fossil fuel sources of energy. So where, where's your, what's your feeling about that? You know, so, so kind of links to the question of, of population, actually. So <clears throat> we've kept... GDP or economic growth outside of the planetary boundary framework. But, but you're abso absolutely right. I mean, these are primary drivers why we are transgressing the boundaries. We are doing more and more research, and many groups in the world are doing research on connecting uh, GDP growth, population growth, even SDG delivery against the planetary boundaries. So perhaps there are groups even in this room doing that kind of interdisciplinary work. So I'm totally with you. It's just that the fundament is that the boundaries themselves um, are, are just setting the biophysical space. And then questions of, of GDP or population or, or technology comes as a, as a next integrator. So for example, we're, we're doing quite some work on can we meet the sustainable development goals within planetary boundaries? That's, that's a big question. And um, there's an initiative called the World in 2050 where uh, led by IASA, uh, which is, you know, saying that 2030 is a milestone for the, for the SDGs, but by 2050 we should continue delivering on the sustainable development goals in terms of, just like Ban Ki-moon pointed out, in terms of the social, um, 169 targets, 17 goals, within planetary boundaries. We cannot risk the planet. Now, the SDGs, interestingly, has four of the boundaries, 6, 13, 14, 15, so biodiversity, fresh water, oceans um, and climate are, are there, um, which is very positive, but not all the nine. Um, two more questions. Um, there's one over there. And sir, just tell us who you are. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Praveen Kumar from the University of Illinois at Armana Champaign. Uh, very, very inspiring talk. And uh, the way I think about it, uh, there are fundamentally two aspects to the climate system. One is the energy, and the second one is water and uh, one doesn't contain the other. Those are two different facets uh, of our climate system. And we have done a pretty good job articulating issues from the energy side using the lens of temperature. And we know 
what those fluctuations uh, are and how they matter. We haven't done that for water and from some of the planetary boundaries, uh, I see that the fresh water has, hasn't crossed the uh, boundary and yet uh, that's one of the most important things that we hear about in terms of floods and droughts and other things. Is there a way for us to characterize the planetary boundary from the lens of water rather than just temperature and create an index? Or what would that look like? Or what are the challenges? I'd love, love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. Briefly, if you would, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a well, really good question. And well, to begin with, the latest planetary boundary assessment does actually put even the freshwater boundary outside of the safe space based on the latest publications, which are outside of the planetary boundary group on both green water and blue water. They've done a fantastic study on the variability in relation to the biological cycle in the, in the, in the late Holocene. Uh, I think it would be really important to include water. Water is victim number one of climate impacts, but we're also changing the whole hydrological cycle, not only because of climate change, but be also because of land system change. So you're right, I think we're missing that indicator on freshwater stability fully. And, and it also perhaps gives me just a final reminder that there is, of course, many environmental impacts occurring before you transgress the planetary boundary, because we're only in the planetary boundary framework only concerned with the stability of the planet, but local environmental impacts like collapse in freshwater systems or droughts or ecosystems collapsing may occur or will occur before you knock over the planet. So it's not, it's not substituting all the great frameworks for environmental management. It's, it's a complement. Final question over here. Hi, my name is Govinda. I'm an entrepreneur building software to decarbonize in our energy systems. So all the discussion, every time I listen to scientists, it depresses me, uh, even though I've done climate science. I think what we need to get back at an individual level, how I can define my own planetary boundaries. I don't know how it can go, because that will make me a little bit more actionable. So I don't know what's your thought at, at the bottom of approach rather than top down approach here. Thank mm. you. Yeah, thanks. No, so I, I, I ended a bit quickly by saying that one of the things that really excites us in the planetary boundary science community is that we're working very closely with the science-based target network, translating the boundaries into operational science-based targets that can be used by companies, individual companies, cities, countries. So, so that is uh, one way of doing it. I think the second is actually just, just to take on that systems perspective and always remembering that you cannot focus in only on, on, on carbon and energy. You have to always look at implications across the other boundaries. And I think it's, it's a very good starting point to start with fresh water and biodiversity as two of those obvious first impacted boundaries when it comes to changes in the climate system. So just as Ban Ki-moon was saying, shorter showers, turn all the lights off. All of those e kind of things. E every, everything is, is good. But I, you know, when I get this question, I, that's, all, that's all important as well. But I think the most important thing that we can do is, is, is to tell this scientific story to our friends and, and to keep this momentum going. I, I think it's a, it really worries me that uh, we, we do not have, we're not close even to understanding that we're putting the whole planet at risk. And we're certainly not close as having a more wide understanding that 1.5 degrees Celsius, we should not play with that number. It's, it's a really serious limit. And so I think it's uh, just, just um, just spreading that message is equally important as, as our own behaviors. Thank you so much, Johan Rockstone. <laughs>